All right, well, happy Friday. Happy Friday, vertebrate zoology students. Um, I'm here to kind of get our first lecture going. Uh, I want to just start introducing some of the themes, some of the um, ecological evolutionary concepts that we're going to carry throughout the semester. So uh, get into some uh, introductory stuff as well here. So let's see. To this point, um, I know we've done a little bit of introductions. Uh, you should be already set up with the um, Labster. Uh, and again, I, I know some of you have had some issues with that. Um, it's a slow process. It's a big, those simulations are big, big, big files. So uh, it is slow to, to get access sometimes. Uh, I'm in communication with Labster. They're supposed to send me some little information that might be useful to you all. As soon as I get that, I'll post it or forward it to you. Um, if you purchased access for $60, uh, that's too much. Uh, they're supposed to reimburse you, refund you back. It should be $50 uh, for the, the Labster account for, 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 for Lab, for the 1113 course, right? So I'll address that a little bit more next week once I hear back from Labster, but uh, you should have communications. I, I got, um, I think, most of the communications through the email. So if you replied, I replied back to you. Uh, that means we're good. We, we can communicate. If you have questions, shoot me an email. I'll reply, you know, as, as quickly as I can. So um, just wanted to kind of, uh, we did all the introductions, kind of just establish the idea of what a busy semester this is probably going to be, right? It, it, it's... It's different. We, we, I don't know if you found this already. I've found I spend more time recording lectures and transferring lectures and uploading lectures than it would have just taken me to, you know, to explain something in class. So we have to factor in a little bit more time now. So time management is going to be important. Balancing your life, uh, if you're working, uh, balancing, you know, little ones of your own, little brothers, little sisters that that clog up time on the computer that make it difficult to concentrate. Um, again, work and life, that's challenging enough. Now we complicate it with academia, right? Books that, you know, learning uh, require time, require time to sit there and focus and, and, and when you can be, you know, attentive to the material. Uh, I, I hope you don't eliminate fun from your life, right? It was part of life. We gotta do things that we enjoy doing. Um, maybe it's video games, maybe it's, I don't know, watching TV, whatever the case, uh, I don't know, can you go party right now? I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but um, all that, keep that, but again, in, in a balance, you got to kind of prioritize, manage your time effectively, uh, scholarships, internships, jobs are all wanting you to build up your resume, volunteer here, volunteer there, um, do what you got to do. I mean, uh, I do encourage you to to find some sort of physical activity that, that you can relieve stress with, that will get your body physically tired. A lot of times it's difficult to, to do with uh, this woman there, right? It's just sleeping peacefully. Maybe at night you, your, your mind is, uh, is still going, right? Your mind is still processing all these things because your body is not physically tired. So we get mentally exhausted, but not necessarily physically exhausted. So um, find some sort of physical activity that you can release um, you know, your stress, energy, and that, that fatigues you so that you can rest better. Those are some just little tips that I can offer you that I think will be useful to you, right? So, um, uh, 13, I'm still trying to remember the number, 1313, 13, the zoology course is, is a fun course, right? I, I love the content. Um, I love this idea of being an organismal biology course. So we focus on the whole organisms. Um, we're going to kind of look at a couple of major themes this semester. So we focus very heavily on the ecology, on the evolution, and the taxonomy of these different vertebrate groups. Right? So every when we're talking about sharks, when we're talking about frogs, when we're talking about uh, kangaroos, whatever the case, right? So we're going to address these within the framework of the taxonomy, the evolutionary basis, the evolutionary history that has led up to this current organism, 
and then the current ecological interactions that that organism deals with, right? So I'm not gonna have time to lecture on all of these in this little lecture right now, but uh, at least I wanna introduce ecology. So, and then we'll hit evolution next week and we'll get into, into the, the content of the course here, right? So uh, ecology focuses on the interactions, on the actual interactions, the physical interactions between two different organisms. They might be the same species, they might be different species, uh, some of those interactions are good. Some of those interactions are going to cause harm or, or stress or, or some sort of discomfort to that organism. So we'll address those. Next week, we'll get into the evolutionary ideas of genetic changes from one generation to another. Right? We get into some of the Darwinian idea, natural selection, uh, genetic mutations, um, different factors that will will modify uh, an organism from, from one generation to the next. And then the, once that mutation or selective pressure happens, then what impact does it now have on the ecology of the organism? Right? So, so we'll, we'll get into these kind of aspects then. Taxonomy is basically the science of classification, these taxonomical categories. You know, what makes uh, an amphibian an amphibian and a, um, you know, a, a mammal, a mammal. What, what qualities, what characteristics allow us to, to categorize these different genres of, of life that we can start to develop. So taxonomy, the categories, evolution, the change, and ecology, the interactions. So throughout the whole semester, all the way till, uh, till December and beyond, uh, we're gonna get into these themes. Now, um, as, as I look through your introductions, I know some of you are going to continue within this idea of zoology. You're going to be a veterinarian or uh, an environmental biologist, something like that. Um, some of you are going into the medical realm be, you know, after this. So I do want to present the material this semester in such a way that it will benefit all of you, right? So whether you go into medicine, whether you go into um, evolutionary theory, whatever the case that you know, what you learned this semester is not just some useless little fact that you have. It, it's maybe a way of reanalyzing the world around us and seeing, you know, how different organisms adapt to, to similar problems, right? So that's sort of the goal. I'm not going to make you a zoologist after this semester. I just want to present the, the natural world around us in such a way that, hey, you know, maybe gives you a little bit of appreciation for what these animals are doing to, to, you know, to survive on a, on a regular basis. There's so many challenges from climate change to pollution to um, overpopulation of humans, habitat encroachment, a lot of things going on that makes it difficult for organisms to persist in their natural, natural world. So um, just, again, the goal for the course here. Uh, when we talk about ecology, um, we have to kind of designate what level, what depth of ecology are we talking about. And so uh, there's different levels. We can focus on ecology at the organismal level. And let's say, I know this is not a, you know, a, a vertebrate, but I can focus on that one particular cactus. Right? That would be the organism. It's kind of good, it's useful, but it's not realistic because organisms do not uh, occur in complete isolation. Organisms are part of populations. So we would uh, conduct populational ecology. We would look at how all of these cacti interact with, with each other. Yeah? Um, some of those interactions, again, are gonna be beneficial. Some of the interactions might be harmful. And beneficial and harmful are going to be different. We have to kind of qualify what do we mean? What, what is a beneficial situation? Something that makes it easier to acquire water. Something that is, makes it easier to, to mate. Something that generates, um, I don't know, more food. Um, something harmful. Something that steals resources. Something that causes injury. Something that can cause death. Right, so again, these interactions are going to vary from the specific organisms that we're talking about, but 
the, the, the concept kind of holds true to all of these levels of, of ecology. So either positive interactions or negative interactions. Uh, stole these pictures off the internet. I don't have any backstory that goes along with them, but um, I don't know. We're looking at a type of ecology, but we're not looking at members of the same type. Right? These are all the same cactus, same species of cactus. Here we're looking at different species. So now we jump into a different level, and that, I'm sorry that that's the wrong chapter. It's from a that doesn't apply here, but. Uh, community members of different organisms, different species, different taxonomical sort of categories. So a monkey is not the same as a parrot. A uh, tiger is not the same as a chimp. Right? But in nature, we do have these types of ecological situations. If the interaction is beneficial for both, if uh, individual one benefits and individual two benefits, we say that is a mutualistic situation, a mutualism. Right? So if one individual benefits and the other is harmed, we say that is a consumptive type of interaction. And if both uh, are harmed by the situation, if neither benefit, we say that is a type of competition. So. Uh, again, sometimes this is straightforward. Sometimes we have to analyze. Sometimes it's not clear as to what ecological situation is going on. Uh, I don't know how you would critique this one. Is this a mutualistic situation? Are both benefiting? Is the is one benefiting? The other one maybe uh, can't breathe. Get off some. I don't know. Maybe the parrot is feeling stress or. Or, or, or being choked somehow, I'm not sure. So we would need more insight, uh, more observation to see what type of ecological situation is going on. And these things are fluid. They're not always just this or that. They kind of blend and they shift and they change uh, over time. So what, to me, I, I might be wrong, but to me, that chimp is exhibiting joy. This is, I don't know, that's the way I interpret it. Like, Look at this little baby tiger. This is so cool. Uh, to me, that's happiness right there. Yeah. Um, the tiger eh, looks sleepy. I don't know if it's enjoying the interaction or not, but this interaction would be very different, let's say, five years from now, right? With a full grown tiger and the, and the chimp. So, again, again, these things are fluid. These interactions evolve and change themselves depending on timing, on situation, and um, that's what makes this uh, ecology a, a fascinating field, right? It, it's very dynamic for sure. Um, I always revert back to reptile examples because that's where I have the most experience with, yeah? But in this situation, we have four lizards. They all live in the same type of area, same geographic setting there, right? What ends up happening though, if they were all evolving, if they're all ecologically interacting in a way where they're looking for the same type of food, they're looking for the same type of habitat, same type of shelter, that's a lot of direct competition. And if we go back, we say, well, competition is not necessarily good. We, we wanna try to avoid competition. So we have this concept in life that we call resource partitioning. Organisms shift their behavior, shift their habits in order to minimize direct competition. So this little speed racer of the group, a right, little striped speed racer, that one is fast you know, and can tolerate the hotter temperatures on the ground. This one is not as fast and says, you know what, I don't have to be as fast because I'm not going to compete on the ground. I'm going to live in this vertical world of the tree trunks. This other one says, you know what, I'm not gonna compete against any of y'all. I'm gonna adapt my body to be stealthy. I wanna be, you know, hide and be sneaky in the horizontal branches here. Um, and, and this one then changes its view, changes its behavior to, to, again, to minimize competition with the others. And this may not necessarily be a conscious decision. This is over the, you know, the, uh, 
geologic time, uh, selective pressures, things like that, mutations. Uh, but what ends up happening now, these four lizard species live close together and, and they thrive in this environment because they have minimized competition, right? And they, it's what we call again, resource partitioning. Uh, I think you are, 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 I think you kind of do the same thing uh, depending on uh, the situation. But let's say you have to go to Walmart, you got to go to Sam's or, or Costco. Do you go, let's say, 2 p.m. on a Saturday? I'm going to guess maybe not. That, that it's, it's going to be packed with people. Um, so if you change the time that you go there, if you shift your schedule to go when there's maybe less people, maybe early in the morning or you know, right before it closes late or something like that, that would then be, again, resource partitioning. Uh, if you're going to try to do things that m minimize competition, like um, trying to get on the road before rush hour, right? That you're trying to minimize that really high competition type of situation. Uh, you're trying to, uh, to get a date. Do you, do you go and, and buy a drink for the prettiest girl in the room? It's going to have all the attention, the 10 or eh, maybe a 7, 6.5 is not too bad. Right? That, you know, different ways of, of analyzing and interpreting this type of situation. But in, in nature, we find that organisms do try to minimize competition as, as much as they can. Neither uh, of the parties benefit from uh, direct competitive situations. So um, going back to the consumptive situations, um, consumption we're going to define now into two ways, right? Positive and negative, we're going to specify now a predatory situation or what we call predation, uh, where one organism, the predator, derives nutrition from the prey. So positive for the predator, very bad negative for the prey. They're dead, they get eaten. So a terrible place to be if you're a little mouse, terrible place to be if you're a seal, terrible place to be if you're a gazelle there, right? So uh, in predatory situations, an organism is killed and consumed, right? And uh, it gets a little blurry there, the, the definition, but if we look at humans, maybe I ate a hamburger. Well, I didn't directly kill the cow, but I still derive nutrition from that. So maybe not direct, but it would be then still considered a predatory type of situation. If you go out hunting, if you go fishing and eat the fish that you catch, you are a predator. If you go, um, you know, eat the, 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 I don't know, the, the pork chops, again, still an uh, indirect type of predatory situation there. So the key point here, the organism is killed for nutritional purpose. If, if the organism is harmed but not killed, that, that doesn't qualify as predation. Uh, within the idea of consumptive interactions, predatory situations, this is going to have a huge impact on the also the ecology, but also the evolutionary basis of these animals, right? Um, if you go out in, in nature, you're going to notice that animals have a very heightened state of alertness. They're always aware. They're always searching. They're, they look paranoid in, in a sense. They're always trying to, to kind of scan the horizon, be sure that there's no predators. And, and if they have to, if, if they don't, if they lose that attentiveness, if they zone out and just kind of not pay attention, bad things can happen. Right, so again, this idea of of being alert is is vital for the survival, long term survival of these individuals. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of the ocean. Maybe some some of you don't like to swim in the ocean. Some of you feel very uncomfortable when when we're not at the top of the food chain. Right, so there's many habitats out in in, in the world where we are not the top level predator. So we're not the, the king of that domain, the queen of that domain. So again, it puts you at that, um, that alert state. If you've ever been in, in bear country, you've ever been in a shark territory and, you know, in, in areas where there's other 
large predators, it, it's a humbling feeling, right? It takes us out of our security and, and, and we kind of shift to that also, that state of alertness. Um, I don't know all the, the back history of this picture, but yeah, not the top level predator in, 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 this, in this picture there. Yeah. Uh, something I've noticed, and you may notice as well, that if you have individuals that go off to war, they're placed in, a, in an environment where they literally are, are being hunted and are hunting, right? And, and you notice when they come back, they retain that very high alert state. It's difficult for them to relax once they've been in that environment. So we know individuals go through PTSD, um, but in essence, you, uh, these individuals basically shift their mentality to a, a predatory state, right? Trying to not be injured, having that, that high state of alertness, right? Uh, I don't know what, if you do, if, if you've been in the military, if you have, thank you for your service. And I hope the transition back to civilian life uh, wasn't uh, too difficult, right? Um, I don't know if you're a narcotraficante, I'm, I hope not, but but if you are, you know that you're always scanning and trying, you know, if you're breaking the law all the time, you're, you're nervous. You see students that are cheating, they're always nervous, trying to, you know, not get caught. So it shifts you to that high alert state. So kind of a, a, a sad in a way, but it, it it converts humans into a more primitive state. The idea of being civilized is that we can go out with confidence that we're not scared, we're not concerned that we're going to get injured walking to the car, walking to the store, that kind of stuff. So with, with civilization comes complacency. Uh, we get lazy. We, get, we lose track of what's around us. And, and that's a, a benefit of living in a civilized society, right? And these individuals maybe have reverted back to that more primitive hunter state. And, and it has an impact on the psychology and it has an impact on the reintegration into normal society when they come back so again not losing too track trying to get back on, on on track here but we know that consumption positive negative and we know that being a predator is positive and negative well there's a different type of positive and negative and we're going to call this parasitism so parasitism is basically the the same positive and negative as Predation, but this negative is not death. This negative is losing a little bit of blood. Uh, the parasite is extracting something from the host, the negative of the host, uh, but the host is going to survive, right? If, if you've been bit by a mosquito, you've been a host to a parasite. If you've been uh, you know, parasitized by internal worms or by fleas or ticks like your dog, um, and then you've acted as a parasite. Now the goal of a parasite again is not to kill the host. It just take a little bit, but if the host dies, the if, if I should say if the if the host dies, the parasite doesn't have enough nutrition anymore. It loses its habitat, its home, its source of energy. So parasites do their best to take, 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 but not enough to to kill the host. So the direct killing of the host is not the parasite's goal. Um, interesting ecological situation. I don't know if you've ever considered babies as parasites. Most ecologists do. So little babies for the first nine months of their life are taking energy from mom, not allowing mom to rest, um, making this discomfort. Um, dad maybe not as directly impacted but mom for sure is, is is feeling the negativity as far as physical symptoms right uh, labor doesn't seem fun uh, but mom then gives birth to the child and then mom's body shifts over to start uh, you know lactating and producing uh, nutrition for the child right and the whole time the child is crying not letting parents sleep pooping um, not you know they're expensive and they don't contribute much, right? So uh, at, at what point then would a child stop being a parasite? At what point would they shift and no longer be that? I don't know, uh, some of you 
Are you still parasites on mom and dad? I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, if, if at some point when the child is older, the parents are older, if things shift around where now the parent is taking, or I should say the child is taking care of the parents, then they break away from that parasitic mold. But if that never happens, that child was a parasite their whole life, right? Uh, you may know people like that, um, but it's part of this uh, just ecological situation that we're going to look at and, and, and get into more details as we progress through the semester. So humans as parasites, huh? Well, um, again, we, we can continue looking at the different levels, right? We, we, we talk about the organism. We talk about populations, members of the same organism. Community members of different species, right? We can look at ecology at the, at the organismal level, at the populational level, and at the community level. So communities are more realistic in, in a sense um, there's a lot of different things like here in El Paso, we have humans interacting with dogs and cats and um, mosquitoes and birds that are pooping everywhere. And, and, and this would be all the living things, the plants, um, you know, the, the cactus around our, our environments. Now, the most realistic would be the ecosystem level. Ecosystem level, we bring all the what we call abiotic factors, the non-living components the heat, the wind, the dust, the soil, the rocks, water, um, all that then factors into all the ecology, the evolutionary uh, history of the particular area. And then if we take all the ecosystems of the planet and piece them all together, terrestrial, all of the, the tropical forests, the deserts, the grasslands, and then all of the non-living um, sort of water and underwater ecosystems tundra and forest and we put all that together we have then our global or biospheric level very difficult to to conduct ecology at that level but that's the level that we live in right that's uh, that's this little rock that spins around the sun that we call planet earth that's that biospheric level there so lots of you know details to get into i'm just trying to lay the framework for now um you know you will have a labster a uh, little sort of what do you call them simulations on, on biomes and different habitats so I'll, I'll hold off on that a little bit but i just wanted to kind of get the class kind of rolled in here so touch a little bit on ecology uh, next week i'll kind of get into evolution and we'll continue with this so check out these videos. I don't want to make them too long because then they're too difficult to, to deal with, to load or download. So I'll call it a, a lecture here. And the next lecture that I'll post on Monday will deal with then the evolutionary themes, the concepts, and sort of how we're going to fit this into this vertebrate zoology course. So for now, we'll call it a day. If you have any questions, again, don't hesitate to shoot me uh, an email communicate with me and I'll address your questions as, as best I can. Okay. So for now, you'll have a great weekend and I'll see you all on Monday.